Good morning, church. Please open your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 5, and we're going to be reading from verses 1 through to 20. If you're on the smaller print Bibles, it should be on page 840. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ according to the accounts of Mark, chapter 5, starting from verse 1. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him a man out of the tombs, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and broke the shackle in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among uh, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about two thousand, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it is that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man and the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him, and he did not permit it, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Hear the word of the Lord. Thank you, Adam. Let's pray. Lord, we uh, thank you for your word again today and uh, just for the encouragement that it is. Uh, And yet, uh, as we look at a passage like this, Lord, there are some uh, perplexing questions that uh, don't seem to have answers. But Lord, we just thank you that just as we have seen that you are Lord of the storm, uh, Lord, that uh, you also have power over evil and uh, that brings great encouragement to our hearts. So encourage us and bless us through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. In some ways, it'd be easy to come to a story like uh, uh, this and dismiss it and say that it is uh, sort of a biblical uh, folklore. Uh, where, where are the incidences like this, we say, uh, today? Uh, most of the cases that we see today, we would say are psychological, uh, or we put down to some sort of medical condition like epilepsy or something like that. And we can easily become cynical of a story such as this. On the other hand, uh, there are those who seem to want to see demons behind every every corner uh, of the room. I've got a neighbor who has uh, icons up in his ceiling all on every room, 
who uh, just to chase the demons away. Uh, a few years ago, I, I had a conversation with a, uh, a young bloke and uh, I asked him how things were going because I knew that he'd been going through a rough time. And uh, I asked him how things were. And he says, oh, things are great. I said, well, how come things have got so, you're doing so well now? He said, well, I've had a, a, a demon of anger cast out of me. Uh, a few weeks later, I ran into him again, and uh, he, he told me things were going really well again, and uh, this time he'd had a demon of lust uh, cast out of him. You see, all his problems were attributed to uh, demons that lived in him, and so he was not responsible for his actions. The devil made him do it. I want to say, though, that human behavior is much more complex than that. And sometimes we just want to oversimplify people's uh, behavior. Uh, we want to say, well, it is a medical problem, or we want to attribute it to the devil. The devil made me do it. However, the, the Bible doesn't do this. In fact, the Bible shows us just how complex human behavior is and that it cannot sort of be reduced to just a medical condition or even to just the devil. I know as a pastor, in the past I've been sort of uh, quick to diagnose human behavior uh, uh, to a sort of a simple uh, superficial solution instead of dealing with the, the underlying uh, causes of the problem. Well, I've dealt with the symptoms of the person's problems and, and not with the, uh, the causes. Here in this passage, though, uh, Jesus deals with the underlying cause of this man's problem, the, the effect that it had. Jesus and his disciples had uh, just experienced this horrific storm. They end up uh, uh, on the other side of the lake, uh, and, um, you know, they'd seen Jesus have power over uh, and th authority over God's creation. Uh, now they've gone from uh, one dangerous moment to another dangerous situation. This passage that we read this morning is the longest and the most detailed account of an exorcism in the Bible. And the first thing we think when we come to that story is we're inclined to think it's a little bit far-fetched. Did it really happen? And the whole uh, pig thing seems a little odd. Certainly there are no parallels in ancient literature to this sort of stuff. So what do we make of it? Well, according to the Bible, there are demons here. And the first thing that comes to mind as a contemporary Aucklander is... Uh, uh, is to think, you don't really think that uh, there are demons in, in our society. Where are they, we might say? Uh, I do not see this sort of behavior necessarily going on in Auckland. Uh, and we want to attribute it, if we see something like that, we want to attrib attribute it to some psychological issue or some medical issue. But I want to say that if you believe in, the, in a supernatural and personal God, as I'm sure most of us do here, why should we not believe in a supernatural and personal devil, as we see here? Now, people might say, well, this is primitive stuff, uh, that we used to believe these things uh, uh, when we didn't understand how the world worked. Uh, uh, these days, we understand more about diseases, we understand more about mental illnesses, uh, epilepsy and the likes, but back then, they didn't understand, and so they blamed the devil for everything. Now, that may be the case in some ancient societies, but the, in the Bible, we have one of the most complex and simplistic uh, least simplistic, uh, uh, least naive, most multidimensional understanding of human behavior. For example, if you turn to Matthew 4, 24, 
we read this about Jesus. It says, so his fame, Jesus' fame, spread throughout all Syria, and they brought, uh, and they brought him to him all the sick. And listen to this list. They brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. It's quite a, a long list of, uh, uh, you know, behavioral uh, uh, problems, isn't it? This range of problems that we see in human behavior and how the Bible understood them. Those with diseases and pains, uh, the demon possessed, the sick, the epileptics. Uh, and the word for uh, epileptic is, uh, can be translated uh, uh, lunatic, or the Greek meaning is a, is a kind of insanity, irrational behavior, seizures. Then there's the paralyzed, and, and we're told that Jesus heals them all. In other words, uh, I, I think that the, the, the biblical writers knew the difference between a physiological illness and a, a demon-possessed person. Or they knew the difference between a demon-possessed person uh, and uh, a person with epilepsy or insanity. Furthermore, we see that many of the great preachers and teachers <coughs> of the past uh, understood these things. For example, if you want to Google uh, Richard Baxter's sermons, who was a, a Puritan preacher in the 17th century, and you Google his sermons about depression, he gives you these, these wonderful insights into the complex nature of human behavior as revealed through the Scriptures. Now, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because we live in a world where the medical fraternity tend to want to prescribe a pill to sort out all our problems. Or the psychologists or the counselors want to say, want us to have us to talk about all our problems and, and uh, get your feelings out. And in certain cases, uh, the, we have to go along with those. Uh, sorts of things, or others say, deal with the problems in a sort of a, a pharisaical way. You you just got to harden up. You got to confess your sin and and then obey the word and do the right thing, and you'll be right. And uh, you know that's the way I used to behave. But the scriptures are much more understanding. And for some, the issue is dealt with through prayer and the word. Through others, the, the issue is, is dealt with through encouragement and talk. Through others, it's exorcism. Through, through others, it's a, a medical solution like Jesus uh, uh, putting uh, clay over that person's eyes. To others, the issue is dealt with through confession and obedience to the Word of God. You see, the, the Bible is so up-to-date, it's so relevant for our modern-day times. Here in this passage, the, the only thing that, can, uh, they, that they can do to control uh, this guy is to chain him. That's the solution. In other words, deal with the symptoms. But now he has actually become uh, even too strong for the chains and he breaks the chains, he breaks the shackles and they're at a loss to know what to do. They're fearful of him. Look at verses uh, 2 to 4. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived amongst the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had uh, often been bound and with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart. He broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. He must be pretty strong to break a chain. You know, so often that's what the world wants to, wants to do. It wants to bring their own solutions to people's problems. Chain them up. Give them a pill. Send them to a counselor. Tell them to harden up. And, uh, uh, and they never allowed Jesus to come in and deal uh, with the underlying causes. 
They forget there is a spiritual dimension, and so they tackle the problem purely from a, a naturalistic in a naturalistic way. On the other hand, I think there are those who, who, who think everything is demonic and only want to deal with issues from a supernatural perspective. Years ago, for example, I got a visit from a um, distressed uh, wife uh, about her, her, her husband's moods. He, he was pra- uh, behaving pretty strangely. He, he was having nightmares and panic attacks, uh, and he was a... Uh, he never had those things before. He, he was quite a well-known businessman. And she thought that he was demon-possessed. So she called in the local Pentecostal pastors, and uh, uh, they went through the house with a fine-tooth comb. They chucked out anything that looked suspicious or anything that looked horrible to look at. Uh, they prayed over him. They prayed over the house. They prayed over everything. They exercised every spiritual uh, demon, uh, so to speak. Still nothing happened. And I began uh, thinking about the situation, and and while I was fully aware that the the devil seemed to be assaulting this man in some way, I I, uh, began to realize there was some underlying cause as to why this happened. And I was reading through James, the book of James. And we're told to resist the devil and he will flee uh, from you. Uh, Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you men of double mind. And it was that phrase, purify your hearts, you men of double mind. And I realized then that just maybe he was not telling the whole truth about his life. So I began to do a bit of digging, and I soon found that this man was having an affair, and the devil had got hold of him. He needed to repent of his adultery, uh, and when he did, he no longer suffered from these attacks. He's a guilty man. All the exercising made little difference because the real issue was not dealt with, his adultery. Even his wife knew about it. And she never even talked about it. You see, human behavior is complex. Here in this passage, we see that this man had become so out of control that that man-made solutions were inadequate to hold him. Evil was now an uncontrollable force in his life that he is now to be feared. In fact, he was harming himself and nobody could stop him. How did he get into that sort of state? Did the demon suddenly come in and take him over? I don't think so. Because there was a time when he could be controlled, but the influence of evil became more and more in his life that it became uncontrollable. And I think there's a lesson here for each one of us here this morning because we can give the devil an opportunity and the devil can take these opportunities and begin to influence us in greater and greater measure. For example, in, in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, it says, Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sin go down on your anger. And then what does it say? And it says, and give no opportunity for the devil. Give no opportunity for the devil. You let anger fester, and it gives opportunity for the devil. 1 Peter 5 speaks of how pride gives an opportunity to the devil who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. You see, by our rebelliousness, by our disobedience, we give, the, uh, we give opportunity to the devil who prowls around like a roaring lion, uh, seeking someone to devour, and maybe that's what happened to this man here in this passage. He's now demon-possessed. He's now being controlled by demons. Here, this man is, is totally controlled by a legion who live inside this man. I must say that the demon possession here is probably not the right word. This Greek word is to be demonized. This man is, uh, is, is demonized so much so that he cannot escape its clutches. 
Uh, look what he says when Jesus asks him his name, verse 9. Uh, and Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, my name's Legion, for we are many. You see, when we, when we disobey God or, uh, or what we know is not right, we're, we're making a pact almost with the devil himself. When we allow things like work or study or family or sport or television or whatever else, uh, our computer, to come between us and God, uh, these things uh, can become our master. These things can become an opportunity for the devil to take a hold. And have you noticed too that when you've allowed something or someone to come between you and God, the longer you leave it, the harder it is to get out of that state. And gradually that thing or that someone takes over your life and the devil gets a hold. You see, the devil comes to steal and kill and destroy, John 10.10. 10 to leave us as cripples, to undermine our relationships. And we see it here. This man is living amongst the dead. His relationships with everyone has been destroyed, and now he's destroying himself. That's what the devil comes to do. And Jesus comes along, and he sees the issue right away, and he confronts it. Uh, note what uh, Legion does in verse 7. He even tries to call on God because he knows that he's confronted by someone that is greater than himself. Legion seems to be the spokesman for uh, many demons living within this, this man, and despite being many, they're still no match for Jesus' power and authority. You see, the problem that Jesus confronts is spiritual. And Jesus has to command them to leave that man and go into the pigs. Look at verse 13. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out, entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. <laughs> there are a lot of questions about that, isn't there? As to why Jesus allowed the demons to bargain with them. And what is the significance of the pigs? And uh, just about every commentary you read is different. Matthew says there were actually two men, and they said to Jesus that he was tormenting them before the time. In other words, maybe it was not the time to utterly destroy the demons completely and that their judgment was yet to come. Or maybe the, the pigs were considered an unclean animal and by sending the demons into the pig, Jesus is, uh, is reiterating the uncleanness of evil. It doesn't sound that convincing though, does it? Or maybe when we, we look at the story, we realize that the Lord has his way of dealing with things and that we shouldn't try to limit him. Maybe that's right. Or maybe it teaches us that we cannot put a price on a human soul because these 2,000 pigs were worth a lot of money. Whatever the reason, I think it's a side issue to that which is of greater importance. And that is that Jesus has complete power and authority over evil. He has complete power and authority over over evil. Even the demons themselves know that. He has to, they have to seek his permission. That these demons had come up against one, uh, the Son of the Most High, God, who had complete power over them. And, and note again that, as we saw last week, that Jesus doesn't work himself up into uh, an emotional sweat. He doesn't roll up his sleeves. He, he actually gives the demons permission to leave the, the man, go into the pigs. They were under his complete power and authority. You see, Jesus is power himself. We saw that in the storm when he tells the storm to uh, be quiet, be still, and the storm obeys. And here we see that same power manifest. That's why these two stories are together. The same power manifest over evil. You see, in the presence 
of Jesus, these demons, about 6,000 of them, that's how many, uh, the number for a legion, 6,000 uh, are down on their knees because they know they're in the presence of an omnipotent God. When an army of demons meets Jesus, there's absolutely no contest. Furthermore, this, this man is restored and he's clothed in his right mind. I love that. He's restored, he's clothed in his right mind. A miracle has taken place in this man's life. It's amazing. He was captive to the evil forces, the, the, the legion that lived in him, but now he is free. He's no longer injuring himself. He's clothed and, and his relationships with others is restored. There, there's a sort of a completeness and wholeness about his life, isn't there? So much so that, that when the town people saw him, they, they were actually afraid because, hey, this is not this bloke, is it? They were in the presence of, of one that was greater than uh, what was once in that man. You know, when I think about this incident, I cannot help but think about the cross. Where Jesus actually changed the places with this man. Have you thought about that? Where him who knew no sin becomes sin for us. Where Jesus was bruised and beaten of his own free will because of our sin. Led out to a lonely hill like this man was. Out of the city, despised, rejected like this man was. Acquainted with grief for the evil we did. And there he was stripped naked like this man, bound and, and nailed to a cross where he died and was left in a tomb. You see the parallels. You see the parallels. Jesus took the, the place of this man that this man might be clothed and in his right mind. You see, it's only the gospel when the gospel is brought to bear upon this man's life that he has made truly well, the good news of Jesus. But there's something else. Uh, this region that Jesus goes to is a Gentile region, a, a Roman region. This is one of the a few Gentile uh, areas that Jesus ministered in. For, for the Jew, the, the Romans were the evil empire. They were the pigs. You know, it's easy for us to be a bit like the Jew and point the finger and say, look at those evil people, we need to get rid of them. But Jesus goes into this region, not with a sword to drive them into the lake, not with a, an army to round them all up and put them in concentration camps. He goes into this region of these Roman pigs, uh, these unclean Gentile people, and he heals one. And this guy is sitting and he's just clothed in his right mind. And as I said, and when we come to the end of the book of Mark, uh, we see Jesus has changed places with this man. We see Jesus naked and bleeding. We see Jesus in the tomb. And this is how Jesus dealt with evil. On the cross, Jesus absorbed evil and injustice and sin and death into himself. He, he died on the cross to pay the debt for our sins so that, that someday he could uh, wipe out evil without wiping out us. And friends, this is the only way that we can defeat evil within our lives. It's, it's only when we realize what it cost him to defeat evil, evil in our lives, that, 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 we, can have, uh, that, we, can, uh, that ha we can have him come into us and make us clean and put us in our right minds in spite of all the things that we've done wrong. You see, when you see the 
the, the cost. When you see him being naked and bleeding and crying out and, and being taken to the tomb for you, that shows just how much he, he loves you and how much he values your life. You see, then you don't have to uh, look at your, your, your career or your business or, or anything else uh, and think that, that you need these things so that you can be fulfilled because Jesus is infinitely greater than anything this world offers. You see, evil is defeated in us when we realize again and again what Jesus has done. The cost of our salvation. When Jesus becomes your joy and delight, uh, the rest of your life gets in perspective. You see things in, your, in a right mind. Now your career is just your career. It, it, it's not your righteousness. It's not your fulfillment. It's not your glory. It, it, it's not your beauty. It's nothing. Lastly, We notice that it doesn't matter how messed up we are. Look how bad this guy was. Look how messed up he was. Look how broken he was. And yet the Lord touched his life and delivered him from evil. And sent him back amongst his own people as an agent of grace and healing to be a vehicle of Jesus' redemptive power. Well, they were frightened of him at the start, but later on Jesus was to go back to uh, uh, this place and, and they welcomed him. And so friends, it, it, it doesn't matter how messed up you are or might have been. You can be a vessel used by God for good. You see, this is what the gospel does. It changes us. It, it clothes us and gives us a right perspective on life so that we become vehicles of grace in this broken world. Let's pray. Oh Lord, this is such a wonderful passage. A wonderful passage. It asks so many questions and yet some of which you just cannot answer. But at the same time, it shows us the glory of the gospel and how wonderful it is and how we can be transformed by it. and be vehicles of your amazing grace. We thank you for this passage. Amen.